I'm Bobby Kinnear, and I'm a member of the Westmont Foundation Board. Um, it is the Mount, excuse me, the Westmont Foundation uh, that sponsors Westmont downtown, which is where you are right now. And this series began over 18 years ago and highlights the important topics of the day and uses the brain cells, the wonderful speaking ability of our Westmont faculty. They bring the information to us. Uh, the series is a gift to our community. The goal for those who attend is to enjoy meaningful, fundamental, and lively conversations. The series consists of four intriguing faculty discussions a year. So this is the last one for the past 23, 24. Right in the fall, we'll start right in with another two. So don't be shy and ask many questions of our speakers because they're ready to answer for you. Now, how many have been here before? And then look at all the other folks who just were here today, is that correct? Okay, so all of those that you came today, all of you, be sure and come back again, okay? This is wonderful and we promise We'll have more chairs. We'll, we can have chairs here and here in the back. So we promise we'll have more chairs. So um, I am so pleased to ask or introduce Dr. Kimberly Dinu, and she in turn will introduce our speakers tonight. Where are you? There you are. Dr. Kim Dinu is the provost and dean of faculty at Westmont. She joined Westmont in August 2022 and has over 25 years of experience in executive leadership in Christian higher education. Previously, Kim worked as vice president for educational programs for the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities in Washington, DC. She spent much of her career at Azusa Pacific University as vice president and chief, chief diversity officer Kim earned a doctor, oh, oh, I'm fiddling around with this computer. Um, Kim earned a doctor of philosophy in sociology at the University of Florida, a, a master of social work from Temple University, and a bachelor of arts in sociology at Vanguard University. And did I mention that Kim is a two-time Fulbright scholar? Born and raised in Los Angeles, she is delighted to be back in California. Kim works closely with the Westmont Foundation Board in coordinating these special lectures. Thank you, Kim. We are very grateful for your expertise. Thank you. And I hope I didn't change something here. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is so good to have you. If you would, look at your neighbor and just say, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> we truly are delighted that you made it out on this Thursday evening. And by the way, happy Women's History Month. We are delighted to have you. Now tonight, or this evening, I have the privilege of introducing two of our uh, stellar faculty members at Westmont. So let me uh, do a, a brief introduction by reading a little bit about their backgrounds and their expertise. I'll start with Dr. Adam Goodworth. Dr. Adam Goodworth graduated from Colorado School of Mines and Engineering. He then earned his PhD in biomedical engineering at Oregon Health and Sciences prior to postdoctoral work in neurology and training in prosthetics. He worked in a rehab science department for nine years in Hartford, Connecticut, prior to actually joining the Westmont faculty at Westmont College in 2019. He researches human balance, mobility, and injury causation using control systems and biomechanics, uh, biomechanics principles. Adam developed the Balance and Biomechanics Lab at Westmont. 
which includes a 3D motion capture camera system, force plates, and an automotive, <laughs> automotive rig for testing airbags and seat belts, and a custom-built motorized perturb perturbation treadmill system. I had to look that up. I was like, what exactly is that, Adam? Uh, perturbation treadmill system. He has obtained grant funding from government sources such as NIH, NSF, and DLD, and other private institutes. He is a professional engineer in California, a member of the American Academy for Forensic Sciences, and a member of the International Society for Posture and Gait Research. If you are a member, also known as a family member, of the Goodworth family, just raise your hand. Any Goodworth family members tonight? How many children? Five children, so he believes in family, right? <laughs> We're so thankful for you, Adam. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mori Hayashida. Dr. Mori Hayashida holds a clinical doctorate in physical therapy, is dual board certified in both orthopedics and sports physical therapy, and is a certified strength and conditioning specialist. He is currently working on a PhD, like overachiever, let's just do another PhD, in movement and science and rehabilitation. His career has consisted of a blend of clinical, entrepreneurial, and academic research endeavors. He is the founder of four health-related companies and is a co-creator of several health and technology innovations. Now, you may have seen Amori's name because he has been featured in physical therapy and sports journals and media regarding emerging practices and technolo uh, technological advancements in physical rehabilitation industry. Dr. Hayashida is an adjunct professor in kinesiology at Westmont College as, and is the executive director of the Research Institute of Human Movement. He is a registered physical therapist for the U.S. Olympic Training Center. His underlying uh, professional interest is in the research and application of human movement related to predicting and preventing injury and enhancing movement performance. Dr. Hayashida lives in Santa Barbara with his wife and two children, and his favorite pastimes are spending time with his family, stand up paddle boarding, scuba diving, hiking, and traveling. So with that, would you please join me in welcoming Drs. Goodworth and Hayashida. Good evening, everybody. I want to make sure we can, you can hear me, so just wave if you can. Um, Really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Denu, uh, the foundation for sponsoring this uh, special event. Uh, I think Adam and I enjoy speaking about human movement, so we're happy to be here. And uh, really what we'd like to do tonight is uh, make it educational, but also practical. So there's, uh, uh, Dr. Goodworth has a lot of demos here you're going to see, and we're tag teaming this. So I'm going to take the front and the back end, and he's going to take the bulk in the middle uh, to go over some demonstrations, both of technology, and then we'll, we'll finish up with uh, some time for question and answers uh, near the end. So if you could hold those, but remember them, because we do want to answer those, and we'll stick around towards the end as well uh, to answer questions. So thank you for having us here. So we're all here, I believe, for the same reason because this topic affects all of us okay so this is about human movement and function um, so I just thought as an intro we, we could look at well what does that mean um, you could argue that we are made to move both from a neuroscience perspective but even at a social intuitive level it, it, I, th I think it wouldn't take much to convince ourselves that uh, movement is part of our lives um, in very small and in very large ways. Certainly coming out of COVID, right, we, we experienced what that impact was in a number of areas. Um, but we're fascinated by it. Whether we move a lot, we seem to be have a 
human uh, intuitive fascination for watching activity, humans in motion, whether it's sports or ballet, or whatever it may be. We're also very involved in applying technologies, as you can see in the picture, where uh, motor vehicles will be adapted for children who have movement disabilities or uh, spinal cord injury and exoskeletons. So there seems to be a lot of uh, need in the human condition to have control or autonomy over our movement. Okay, and what I'll often say to our students is movement, human movement seems to be uh, an intuitive thing. Of course we need it and want it, but it also seems to very, be a very elusive thing, especially as we go through the decades. Okay, so what I hope is um, that we can address some of the real fundamentals about human movement, but also address uh, what's coming in the future and what we can expect. So I'm going to start at a high level and bring us down to some very uh, specific levels uh, that uh, Dr. Goodworth will, will lead us into some examples. But when you look at a lifespan, so I'll use this slide with some of my uh, undergraduate students, um, and on the left to the right is your life, so we'll call that the lifespan of human movement. Um, as we know, uh, babies after birth learn to move without instruction, okay? So there's a hard wiring in the nervous system for them to learn uh, to move, and that comes about through process, uh, a sequential process of events. Um, we go through life and we optimize that movement. We become very adept. In this case, we're just looking at the task of walking, okay? And then as the years go by and during our aging years, there are changes physiologically, neurocognitively, and so forth that will change the way we have to adapt and learn to move differently. Okay, so what I'm going to propose in the first uh, section here is what can we be doing early and even in the present to optimize the conditions we're under, physically, mentally, emotionally, neurologically speaking, to maximize outcomes from a movement perspective. Uh, three basic things that are, are, uh, have been identified when you look at motor development and, and motor learning, okay? This spectrum of motor behavior, how do I move? That's a form of behavior. Uh, so from a learning perspective and a development perspective, we have to have stability first, and then we tend to learn to develop locomotion. How do I move the body? Um, and then from there, how do I manipulate and engage objects and then the environment? Okay, so if we look at babies, and at Westmont we'll, we run a baby lab um, in the motor behavior class at times where we'll bring babies in. It's a good experience for the students to see uh, milestones in movement happening. But what I'd like you to think about is it's not just for the baby or infant. This, these patterns and these principles continue through life. Okay, and there's a lot to learn from these. So I'm going to play a couple of videos, and I hope you'll see some of these patterns. So when we talk about stability, um, sitting is a stability. It's a mechanical support of the posture of the trunk. Um, and then there's intent, there's motivation to move and go somewhere with it. And we'll talk about the way that happens and how, the way to optimize it. How many here could get off the ground like that? That is <laughs> probably not too many of us. Speaking of movement, it would be, even be nice if we could circulate, it looks like, as we are short of chairs. But, um, it is good to change positions and often I wish we could all move that well. Um, if you look at this same child in motion, he comes across and sees somewhere he wants to go and there's a couple steps in his way. So his environment poses a challenge and he has to figure out a way to get there. Okay. So what I wanted to illustrate with this slide is that there's intent and there's outcomes that we all have desires for. And movement is a very personalized thing. Very similar principles that we all share, but very personalized. We're motivated by different reasons to move. Okay, so keep that in mind as we look at the applications uh, of movement. And in this, in this slide, before walking comes crawling, and there's a reason we have to learn to crawl before we walk, neurologically, neurophysiologically. Okay, but again, just a transition, and uh, I think there's some chalk art down here, and so this is an example of manipulation of an object. Finding an object, using it with our hands, and being dexterous uh, with that object, okay? We're gonna get into a little bit of academic stuff, but I think it's helpful to put perspective on what we're talking about when we say movement. So, 
not only what is movement, part of to, an that, to answer that question is we need to think about the principle in this theory, ecological dynamics theory, which was presented in the late 80s and 90s, um, of the person, the task, and the environment, okay, and the constant interaction between all three. So at all times, the individual who's moving does depend on the environment they're moving in and their task they're intending to do. And it may vary when any of those variables change. Perception and action, okay, is this tandem partnership that we're all seeking to do. And perception is what your mind and your brain perceives from the interpretation of sensations you're getting, whether it's visual or audio or, or physiological coming from the body, somatosensory senses. And Dr. Goodworth will be getting into some of that further. Affordances is, is this idea of what opportunities to move does the environment provide you? And how do you navigate that? If I were gonna walk out the door now, I would walk out differently because there's all of you between me and my car. But if you weren't there, I would walk out a little differently. The environments will change, but I'm still walking. So does my mind have the ability to take in those senses, make a perceptual decision, and create an action or a movement, okay, that is logical and effective? Ultimately, we're looking for this outcome. We want a positive outcome. Um, again, so then going back to what is movement. There's a few key words I just wanted to know, put in this uh, caption here from these authors, but an individ individual has to adapt to the environment that they're in, and it is largely based on the physical action capacities or capabilities that they have to do that, okay? So what we're making an argument for is what can we do on a day-to-day -day basis to maximize our capabilities to move so that we have options? to move based on the affordances or the constraints that the environment provides us. Okay, so whether you're a professional athlete, whether you're a child in elementary school, whether you're in your later years, we need to maximize our opportunities to move. So that would be things like range of motion. How much range of motion do you have in your knee or your spine to stand upright? Okay, or the strength or coordination to manage in, in varying uh, environmental settings. And that's what we mean by sensory action coupling, this combination of the two. So we've talked a little bit about what movement is, but why does it matter? This is maybe the intuitive part of movement, okay? We can all obviously say, well, it does matter to my physical well-being. Um, I think, at least for myself, COVID was um, a eye-opening in terms of how much it mattered for my mental and emotional well-being as well. Uh, but there's plenty of research we could go through there. Socially, ultimately, this is how we experience life, okay? It's, it's the emotions, the relationships, and the drivers in our lives uh, that require it. So that's why it matters. But to be more detailed in a practical way here, these authors will present um, certain findings that we use in the clinics when we're working with people with balance or function or mobility uh, issues. It is age-related, okay? I, I think we can all attest to we feel and move differently in the seventh decade than in our second decade, all right? Um, muscles will tend to atrophy a little quicker, bone demineralizes, uh, neurophysiology changes, and, and so forth, okay? Are you glad you came? <laughs> you don't need me to remind us, we've all been there. Okay, so there is age related, but it is environmentally determined. Okay, we need to know what our environments are in that we're functioning in. Uh, and then there's competence. So movement competence is what we're all seeking for. Again, how, what, how, what can I do to maximize my physical mobility and competence in motion? And what we found in literature is that physical activity being the main determinant of what most people define as their quality of life can I independently move? And that defines, that's the number one in the literature reason uh, that people will ultimately define quality of living, okay? So obviously very, very important and why it matters here. Just a quick takeaway from this slide. This is a study done. I wanted to highlight a couple of things because I think many of us are doing things to try to maintain balance and mobility. What we're finding in this study is gait speed, so how fast you walk, uh, body balance, so how well you control your center of mass over your base of support, your balance. Those things are important, 
But more important is the physical activity. So if I train for balance or I train for my gait speed, which we do in the clinic all the time, you know, what do I need to do that? It's only a relative if that individual or patient then goes home and is physically active. Okay, use it or lose it, uh, that mentality. Okay, training is one thing so that you can go and use it in practical situations. Same with the athletes. It doesn't do much good if you just go to practice but never play a game or perform with it. Okay, so I think that's the takeaway here. Um, physical activity in the literature is defined by daily sports, leisure, leisure recreational activity, gardening, that, that kind of thing. Um, and the environment, though, again, matters. So hopefully we're seeing a bit of a theme here um, with this uh, movement and environment. So there is a balance through life. These are some stats, and many of us probably are familiar with the, the, um, the downside to having a fall event, as we would say in the literature, and the objective is to prevent the first fall. I think the takeaway here is that statistically speaking, a second or third fall is much more likely to occur if there's been an initial fall. Um, now, avoiding the initial fall would be primary objective, but even if you have had that, there's plenty to do to minimize that risk. So I, I don't want anyone to feel like if you've had a fall event that you're destined to be one of the stats here, or it's twice as likely. But I do want to illustrate the, the point here and the emphasis. So this is my anecdotal observations, okay, when it comes to, um, well, what is it, at least in first world culture, okay, that's our culture, very different from other cultures where um, transportation is different, cultures are different, ethnicities, beliefs are very different. But in first world living, we have environmental conveniences. There's a lot of reasons not to move well. Okay, we could be in a lot of parts of the world, instead of chairs, we'd be squatting or sitting on a stone or a log or something else. And that actually creates a movement behavior and a physical capability to do more. Okay, so we have a lot of reasons not to move in our culture. Social determinants, that would be things like uh, distance to healthcare or education uh, for a variety of reasons. Okay, socioeconomic reasons, ethnic, racial, etc. Pain and peri-pain events. I see this a lot in the clinic. This is essentially why we have physical therapy clinics, is if it hurts when you move, that's what we treat. Um, the challenge sometimes is after we treat the pain, you may still have bouts and reoccurring issues, and those will alter the way the nervous system operates, your movement and your planning. There's a fear of hurting your back again when you pick up your grandchild. There's a fear of going downstairs when that knee hurt used to hurt. Okay, so how do we overcome those past experience or, or those reoccurring experiences? Um, neurodegenerative diseases, I would just say maybe age-related neurocognitive changes is a barrier. But I think the big one that I highlight he highlighted here is the beliefs about falls and aging, I find, matter. And, it, 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 and that's why we're here tonight, is really to try to understand um, what do we know and what do we think about, or do we have a fear of falling? If we do, we're more likely to fall. So how do we reverse the fear of falling or address that issue? Um, and I'm too old for that, okay? We often get told that as we're middle age or later ages, so we, we either opt out or even our healthcare providers opt us out, okay? Don't run anymore, don't play pickleball. There's a lot of pickleballers here, I'm sure. Um, because my knee hurts when you do it. So if you avoid everything, guess what happens? Okay, you regress and you regress further. So the thing, if, if there's anything I can really just press upon all of us is don't give up, don't stop. There's always something better. If you make a 5% improvement in knee range of motion or back or mobility, you get like a 30, 40% yield in function, quality of life, okay? So we don't need to be perfect. We just need to be better. Uh, is the big idea. All right, this is my transition. All right, well, um, so my main goal here, you guys, is to give you a little bit of the science overview of what research has shown about the nervous system and biomechanics around balance. And for most of the principles that I'm gonna describe, I'm gonna have kind of a link to aging. 
And sometimes the link will be some research study that people have done with older adults investigating this particular principle. And usually the finding is like, this is a little bit worse in older adults. But instead of like having that be a negative thing, I think we can take those findings and say, well, this is one thing that could get worse. And these are some areas we can specifically work on to improve this aspect of balance control. So first I wanna jump into the goal of balance. The goal of balance is to keep your center of mass within your base of support in general. There's times when you're walking or running where your center of mass might be temporarily outside of your base of support. But in general, we think of balance like this. You think of your center of mass as more or less being the point on your body where the majority of your mass is located. So for most people, it's somewhere around their stomach, belly button area and kind of midline from anterior to posterior front to back. And your base of support is normally considered, if you're just standing still, the area under your feet, okay? Now there's certainly, there's things that can change that. If you grab onto a table, I've now changed my base of support to be the whole table here and my feet. So if I grab a cane, now I've extended my base of support. So one of the links to aging is just that when people use assistive devices, one of the ways that assistive devices help is just by literally increasing your base of support, giving your center of mass a larger area to move around while you're still maintaining balance. Okay. One of the second aspects that's really important to note about balance is that balance wouldn't be a big deal if it weren't for gravity. Right? And so gravity is this force that's always acting on us, and it is, causes us to be what we call inherently unstable. Inherently unstable means that if you could somehow maintain a perfect upright position, then gravity would be sending you straight down through your ankle joint, and you wouldn't be destabilized at all. But the second you take a breath, you deviate from upright just a little bit, and when you deviate from upright a little bit, gravity tends to send you further in that direction that you just deviated from. So then you tend to go even farther in that direction. Then gravity sends you even further. And the bad news is that the further you deviate from gravity, the torque, which is sort of this engineering term that's force times distance, the torque basically becomes bigger the further you deviate. So that's why we refer to balance as being inherently unstable, okay? Now, the link to aging is as you fall farther from upright, you fall faster and it requires more strength. So one of the key things, maintaining good muscle strength directly helps you combat gravity. So that's a good push for muscle strength. Um, even though balance is complicated, it's got you know, multi-segment body, knees and ankles, we can do some nice approximations with just like a single link. And one of the best things I learned for teaching, you guys may or may not know this, but I think that kinesiology students are the most competitive students on campus. <laughs> so when you can leverage that in school, it helps really well. So I've invited a few champions up here. So come on up. Um, Elijah, are you here too? Okay, so we've got Alexa, raise your hand. Taylor, Elijah, okay. And they're gonna compete. And you guys can take a vote on which one you think is gonna win a balance. <laughs> Why don't you guys over here? I'll give you guys each one. Anyone want uh, Alexa? Yeah? <laughs> and here's the thing, kinesiology professors are competitive too, so I'm going for this also. All right? So one finger, one finger, upright like this, okay? And you're gonna notice that the stick is just gonna, as it deviates further from upright, if they don't make a correction, the stick is gonna fall, okay? So, vote on your champion. Here we go. I started already. How are you guys doing? Elijah, you're looking pretty good. Taylor, are you still in? Oh, no. Alexa, is she still in? Oh my goodness. Wow. All right, Alexa. Very good. Thank you, guys. You can have a speak. That was a little bit of extra credit yeah. for all that. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the key things, even with balancing a stick, how do you think that would have gone if they closed their eyes? Not quite as good, right? What would happen if we put their finger in ice and close their eyes? Dead meat, right? It's, it's, it's over. You need to use sensory feedback to balance. 
And the three main systems that you use for sensory feedback is your inner ear vestibular system, which involves these little hair cells that when you move your head around, the hair cells deflect. And when they deflect, they open up little channels. And when those little channels open up, little electrical signals go zapping into your brain. And your brain can somehow interpret that as, I just moved my head. It's amazing, right? We can actually demonstrate the vestibular system really well in a task that's not balance related. It's more about your visual stability. So if you guys could do this with me, can you put your finger in front of your uh, face here? So can you see your fingerprint? It's a little bit dark here, but see if you can see your fingerprint. If you can, that's good. Now slowly move your head. You should hopefully still see your fingerprint. Move your head a little faster, a little faster. I can move my head about this fast and still see my fingerprint. Can you guys? That's because you have what's called a vestibular ocular reflex. So when you move your head, there's a neural circuit that goes from your vestibular system to your eyeball. So if I move my head to the left, my eyeball goes to the right at the same velocity. So that's a demonstration of a good vestibular system. If you do the same thing with your finger, though, now move your finger at the same speed. Fingerprint's gone, right? You don't have a finger ocular reflex, right? Um, but you do for the vestibular system for gaze stability. But your brain also uses your vestibular for balance. The other thing, of course, is vision. That one's pretty obvious. You're uh, scanning the visual world, finding vertical, horizontal cues to orient to. And then the final one is somatosensory. And somatosensory is pretty amazing. When I was a grad student, this is when I fell in love with neuroscience. My PhD advisor said, what? You don't know somatosensory? And he handed me a, a neuroscience textbook and said, read. And talk to me in two days. And so I started reading these chapters about proprioceptive feedback and all these neurons that are in your muscles, in your skin, and it's incredible. You've got these little specialized cells embedded in your muscles and your skin, and when they get stretched or when they get pushed, they send little signals to your brain, just little action potentials, and based on how quickly they're sent, your brain can interpret those, interpret the vestibular feedback, interpret the visual feedback, put it together to get an estimate of where you are in space, which muscles you should activate, when you should activate them, and how much you should activate them. It's incredible, right? So I love you know, our bodies and our nervous system. <laughs> the link to aging, though, over time, each of these systems can degrade. So various research studies have shown for each of them, and I'm just pointing out one study for each of them. Uh, one study found that for people over 40 years old, vestibular dysfunction is found in 35% of people and that tends to increase as you get older. That means the hair cells in your inner ear are either dying or not functioning as well, or your ability to interpret information from them is being degraded. Uh, visual impairment, of course, can uh, increase with age, and even the structural and physiological function of your receptors in your skin and your muscles and things like that can decline with age. Now, of course, the link the positive spin on that is that the more you use this sensory feedback for functional movement that's meaningful to you, the more your brain can refine the use of that sensory feedback. You can, you can reduce the degradation by using sensory feedback, multi-sensory feedback from your different systems. Um, a couple other things about the sensory systems that I just want to point out is that each sensory system provides different information. Your inner ear gives you some information about where you are with respect to gravity. Your visual information gives you information about where you are to an outside world, which can sometimes be tricky, like if you're on a boat. And proprioceptive somatosensory gives you information about where one body segment is relative to yourself. So they're all kind of giving different information that your brain is using. And each system could degrade differently for different people. Um, which then has a direct impact on which system people tend to pay attention to. So whichever system tends to decline more, the natural tendency is for people to compensate by paying more attention to the other systems. And so in general, people have found that with aging, people tend to rely more on somatosensory and more on vision and a little less on your inner ear vestibular system. So practicing balance in a variety of contexts is one of the ways to keep that vestibular cues and your interpretation of it in good form. Just a couple more things about balance. Balance is anticipatory, meaning that my brain, as Maury pointed out a couple times, you look and you plan out what you're going to do. And sometimes you, you're not cognitively, consciously doing it, but it happens nonetheless. If I grab this podium and I push against the podium, 
okay? The first muscle that's activated is actually my leg muscle, not my arm muscle. Because my brain knows if I'm planning to push against the podium, it's gonna push me back, so I activate my leg muscles first to counteract that so I've stiffened up so I don't knock myself over. I don't wanna react to myself, I wanna predict what that's gonna be, okay? Linked to aging, unfortunately, some studies have found that those anticipatory postural adjustments are kind of delayed with age, but again, practice is good. Um, different posture strategies. This is another way that people think of posture control. If you're given a small perturbation, I like to use that word, we like to shake people and challenge people. If you're given a small perturbation, a small challenge, people tend to stand and rotate about their ankle joint. They kind of look like this. You know, nice and easy. But when you get a larger perturbation, people tend to bend their knees and move their hips back a little bit, right? And then when you get a really large perturbation or what you perceive as a large perturbation, you will change your base of support, step, or grab something. Those are the three kind of categories that people typically say for balance control. And with aging, older adults tend to perceive a perturbation or a challenge as more severe than a younger adult would be. So they might be more likely to take a step or they might be more likely to use a hip strategy bending their knees. Um, I'll just show you a quick video here of what some research studies have shown for like reactive balance stepping. So these people are on, on a force plate and the whole plate can suddenly move. People do all sorts of crazy balance studies. I've literally seen balance studies where they're walking on a treadmill and they take some slippery goo and they wipe it on the tread without the person knowing it so they slip on the treadmill. Or I've seen false floors, where you're walking in a lab, everything seems nice, but the tile on the floor can take off with a motor and cause you to trip and fall. So if you thought my perturbation treadmill was weird, I've seen worse. So, okay, but this is just a moving floor one. So this is a normal reaction. Nice step, the floor moves, you take a step. This is someone who's an older adult that does have a neurological disorder, um, Parkinson's. And you can see the impaired ability to make a reactive step there. So the summary of some of these principles, number one, we generally want to keep our center of mass inside our base of support. Number two, our bodies are inherently unstable because of gravity. So we need to use sensory feedback. Our brain integrates sensory feedback from different sensory sources, from multi-sensory feedback. And balance responses include things that are anticipatory, they're strategy dependent, whether we move at our ankles or our hips or take a step, and they're also adaptive. The more you do something, you can actually alter your strategy and your responses, usually in a good way. Um, so now that kind of summarizes sort of the neuro overview of balance. I wanna give you just a couple of examples about some kind of research, high-tech, low-tech methods that people have used. I already mentioned the slippery banana. Um, there's a couple other ones that are a little interesting as well. Um, so I'll do a couple demos also, but let me just kind of give you a couple visuals first. Force plates. This is a common one that people use. We have a force plate right up here. A force plate measures uh, the ground reaction forces under your feet. And one of the ways that researchers try to understand your balance is by having you stand on a force plate. So I'm going to have Zhang Min, a very good kinesiology student, come on up here and demo a little bit. Oh, that's my son, one of my sons. <laughs> it was St. Patrick's Day, or like, you know, recently. So, okay. So, let us go to this one. Normal force. All right, so Jung Min, show us this force plate. When you apply force, what happens? Oh, the force goes up, come on off. Nice, comes back down. Show us a jump. Nice spike. Now jump from this force plate. We got a little, a little air time there, okay. Can you do a squat, a one leg squat, see if that challenges your balance at all? Okay, oh gosh, come on. <laughs> Let's pretend like it's a little bit more of a normal squat, okay. <laughs> so there's some wiggling, we can pick up the wiggles. Okay, very good, John, man, okay. So what we'll often, <laughs> So what we'll often see with force plate data is we'll collect these ground reaction forces from these different sensors and we'll try to figure out what are the ways that he pushed against the ground in order to balance. And that gives us some clue about his brain and his neural control. There's other types of methods we might use like accelerometers. So here's an example. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes people will put these accelerometers near the chest or the center of mass when people walk around a little bit. Come a little closer to my computer. I don't think it can keep up with that sample rate. Okay. And then other times they might even put the accelerometer on someone's head. Oh, well, it's not liking my sample rate. We're just going to let that go. But they might put it on someone's head to look at the head accelerations. And people who have vestibular deficiencies will sometimes move their head less. It's almost like they want to avoid the head movements. And that's one of the things that people have found with portable technology like accelerometers. Um, let me move on to a few of the other types of technology. Uh, there's a type of system called EMG or electromyography that's put on muscles and it can measure people's muscle activations. So that really tries to get into the nervous system. And then kinematics just means we put markers on people and we try to measure how they move. There's some really cool systems out there that perturb you. For example, this one here at the University of British Columbia, they shake you around on a platform. They even give you what's called vestibular, galvanic vestibular stimulation. So they zap your vestibular system with the battery to evoke a postural response. And I know that sounds weird, but actually every one of you could do it at home if you wanted to. And I'm not saying you should. <laughs> I did it once. I took a 9-volt battery, I took two little wires, I put my feet together and I closed my eyes and I put the two wires in my ears. And I, just a little 9-volt battery, you can get a target. And I had a little bit of a popping sound in the ears and I felt myself, you know, wobbling. And it was at that point, that was like my last couple months before I graduated with my grad degree. And my wife was like, you have got to graduate and get out of this field. But, <laughs> In all reality, all joking aside, we're actually developing a technology like that. If you've heard of a cochlear implant, there's, I was on a project for about four years where we were trying to work on a vestibular implant, which basically artificially activates the inner ear vestibular system using an accelerometer on the head. And it's a really similar technology to you know, neural stimulation, but in a strategic and safe way, of course. Uh, this other system here is really cool. It uses VR. The platform moves while you're working on a treadmill, walking on a treadmill. Here's a couple videos from Variant Lab. You can see these are higher performers, but you can see the ground reaction forces that people measure with those little arrows there can be really helpful for research. And really with that, we are on to our Moria gun. So. So how many here want to be one of his subjects in this experiment? <laughs> but on the other side, how many want to be in his class, his lecture? I mean, that really, that's a, I do. Maybe we could arrange that faculty, visit faculty, yeah. Um, so I get to wrap this up a little bit and towards a little clinical perspective. What can you do today? Um, what are options? And then what do we think options might be in the future? Um, as technology is rapidly changing and, and AI has introduced a, a global change of the way we do a lot of things. So, um, but briefly, these I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of slides showing you um, different types of screenings that are done. When we look at general movement uh, of someone, it includes, we're screening for balance, but we're screening for strength and coordination and agility and other aspects, okay, but they all come together. So movement competency screen, you can see vaguely perhaps, maybe not so much from the back, different postures and movements that are fundamental to human performance and human function. So it is things like squatting, lunging, twisting, pushing, pulling, it's basic gross movements that we all need in day-to-day -day life. And how do we assess that and score it quantitatively um, in order to make decisions about who needs what kind of training? Not everybody needs the same training. We might all have balance challenges, but if we're gonna personalize this and be more effective in treatment, we need to uh, assess and understand how we're different and what kinds of uh, training we need. Uh, this one here is a functional movement screen. You see this a lot in athletics and our military. It's an injury predictive scale. A lot of research has been done. Uh, if you score below a certain threshold, you're likely to have uh, a certain type of injury that keeps you out of performance. So you'll see this used, but again, very similar, right? We're looking at um, different parts of the body doing different types of, of fundamental and necessary movements. Um, this is a dynamic neural stabilization. There's an assessment and a training protocol. Many clinicians will be trained and, uh, and you can see, I just put this in to illustrate the connection to 
developmental movement. So it's the same nervous system as you had when you were a child that you now have as an adult. Um, and so there are movement patterns that you have stored. And the idea here is how do we measure and how do we reinforce uh, primal learning patterns uh, that you've developed early in your life? Okay. Uh, some of the frontiers here on where we're heading, um, most of us probably all at this point have a cell phone on us. So we might call that a nearable device. Wearable devices would be like the accelerometer that Adam had up here uh, with John Min. Um, but it's getting woven into your clothing now and bracelets, socks, rings. Uh, these are all types of wearable devices that will collect a variety of types of data uh, about not just movement related data, but your heart rate and heart rate variability and new blood pressure cuffs, watches are coming out FDA approved this year and so forth. So there's a lot of types of metrics uh, being put into uh, play that are collecting data um, on something that you wear with your body. Uh, and then the programming is what do they do with that data? How does that give you information or your healthcare providers information? So there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. There's also some maybe dilemmas, um, ethical, moral dilemmas on that kind of big data collection, right? But this is the world we're, we're in. Uh, let's see here, Adam, if I go, yeah. let's see if this runs. Here's a video, and this is human activity recognition. So this is where um, optics and, and uh, data from multiple um, sources can be aggregated with AI to get less information and give you more predictive uh, capabilities, okay? So if I wanted to know about my walking gait speed, we talked, remember we talked about the speed of your gait is an indicator of a fall risk or your balance and so forth. Um, I'd like to know about the patterns and behaviors that you have throughout the day. Uh, it'll look differently maybe in the morning than it does later in the day. It looks different if you're not experiencing pain or if you're experiencing pain. So the big data capabilities um, with human activity recognition is an assimilation of lots of different information coming from your phone, your watch, uh, a camera somewhere, the Wi-Fi in your room even, um, and, and networking and creating a bigger picture, a bigger story of your human movement behaviors. Uh, from that story, we can gather uh, information about how you actually live. As a physical therapist, when I have a patient come to the clinic, I see a small slice of what their life is like. We do some testing, we might even do treatment and training, and then they leave and I have no idea what their life looks like. It would be really nice if I did. It would inform me to make a more specific uh, intervention and program for you. So that's kind of the idea with some of this uh, technology that's on the brink, in development, reliability and validity of it is still uh, uh, in question, but it's, it's going to be there. Um, so a couple last slides, and then we all need to get up and move, change position. Um, some self-care ideas. Uh, there's a website here. I think this group has done a, a good job at providing ideas. Those the resources. Feel free to contact us as well about fundamental movements. So bottom line, train fundamental movements. Um, if there was one thing I would want all of us to walk out, and regardless of your age, learn to squat really well. What are the techniques of squatting? That's what you need to get into the chair and out of the chair. But a lot of the transitions we make, that's where the falls happen. So falling occurs in transition from one position to another position. So train those transitions, okay, is the big idea. Um, start simple, start low tech. Okay, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, do it often, okay? Don't train occasionally, do it multiple times a day. Um, build your stamina, build your confidence will be a result, okay? Confidence comes from the doing, not from the knowing when it comes to movement. We have to experience the movement to be confident in it. Um, vary your context. Don't just always work out in the same place. Go outside into a park to do your squats. Do it at the physical therapy clinic. Do it at home. Okay, change your environmental cues um, when you're training. And then don't stop. Okay, what gets you better keeps you better. So if you go to rehab, if you work on the knee, whatever helps, uh, keep doing it. As soon as you stop moving and training something, the body's too efficient to, need to keep that, okay? We have to use it if we're gonna keep, uh, keep the capabilities uh, to use it. And then lastly, just some key takeaways from uh, what we've 
what we've said here tonight, um, it's never too late, but start early. Okay, for all the college students who are here, who think they'll never be at a place where movement will be hard, start now, okay? Um, us older people know what that, that that's very true. Uh, stability first, so we need stability, we need balance. Um, then we have to get in motion. Don't worry about strength until you have the motion. Okay, so clinically we see you're only as strong as you're capable to move in. So if you don't have the mobility, get the motion first. And then strength is easy, that's the icing on the cake part. Um, the debate about how do I move versus the outcome of my movement. If I get a task done, who cares how I did it? Sometimes that's true and other times it's not, okay? Um, if I walk across the room upright or bent over, does it matter if as long as I get to the other side of the room? Well, for that moment it does, but for a period of time, if I walk bent over, something's gonna hurt, perhaps. So we don't, do need to pay attention to not what we do, but how we do it, especially when it comes to the exercises that you're that you're doing. Uh, variability is key, okay? The body has so many degrees of freedom. It moves in so many different ways. You need to train all those ways, okay? We lose motion, we lose mobility when we don't push the borders. We're afraid because that spine hurts if I go this way or my knee hurts, okay? So you need to identify when is it okay to push through discomfort all right, and, uh, and not be afraid of the discomfort, okay? Uh, Fall prevention exercises. Last thing, this, this uh, I thought this was a very good study, really just identifying many of us, there's many fall prevention balance classes that are out there. Bottom line, they all seem to have some benefit. So don't worry too much about what type it is and so forth. Something that's different than what you're doing is probably gonna help at some level. Having said that, there would be some limitations to this study in terms of how and their patient sampling and so forth. Um, what I would add to that is, keep changing and evolving. Don't stay in the same class for the above mentioned reasons. Move to a different class, make it harder um, and more challenging, okay? So constantly keep changing your, your setting. That's us talking, but um, we're here to, I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Um, so feel free as a group. <laughs> The question was, can Maury please show us a squat? He beat me to the microphone. How about, if you have room, stand up and do it. It's yeah. easier if you do it together. You might as well stretch. Don't knock each other over, though. And now maybe you can't see me. I'll, I'll speak loudly and I'll, I'll uh, illustrate. But there's different forms of squats. The first basic one would be feet about the hip width apart, okay? And just try to imagine, visualize going straight down, okay? If my whole body just went straight down, don't lean forward to squat, don't lean back to squat. Let your body naturally go down, which does mean you do lean forward and sit back. Okay, now if you look at your partner and do that, let's everybody do five of them. All right, and look at your partner. You're gonna see uh, different variations of a squat. And this, I need a video because you all look funny. <laughs> but a squat ideally would be trained. Now, some of you are leaving your heels. Try to keep the heels down and only go, go as low as you can go. And, and you'll see some variations there, okay? But uh, try to stick the bottom out. So we don't know because everyone's a little bit different, but most people need to be cued to stick the bottom out and to lean forward, but not to the point where they're bowing. Okay, so try to keep your chest up and eyes up while you sit your bottom back. The weight should be at the midsole, if anything, towards the heel of your foot. Okay, so that would be one basic form. Yeah. I think there's a question in the back. So the question had to do with what should you be looking at is it when you're walking? Should you be looking down in front of you? 
So my answer from reading the research, and I'd be curious how Maury answers this, is that yes and no. So as a general rule, you want to be obviously aware of what's in front of you on the ground for obstacle avoidance, period. However, some of the research studies that I've done and seen is that balance is generally better when people are looking up at something vertical and horizontal that you can align yourself to. But obviously that doesn't mean you disregard the rock in front of your feet. So a little bit of both, but for regular steady state movements, I would think a horizontal vertical cue is probably the best. Yeah, that move, leaning forward, looking down can definitely have a tendency to shift your center of mass, you know, forward relative to your feet. Yeah. This is one of the best balance programs I've ever gone to, and I actually teach balance classes. So first of all, thank you very much. It's very well done, based on good research for the I, I teach at Santa Barbara City College part time and privately too. But um, so thank you. And I do have some people I work with. Of course, I work with seniors and younger adults that are they have peripheral neuropathy and all these other things, and I just can't correct those. Um, so especially for peripheral neuropathy, that that's feeling. So sometimes the vestibular and the visual. I, I tell them if you're missing just one that's a little bit off on those three systems and Usually you can do okay, but two or three, well, three of them are effective. So how would you deal with somebody that just has, doesn't has lack of sense of feeling in their feet? Or they wear these thick polka shoes or something that, in fact, I'd be curious about that, what you think about the type of shoes that are very cushiony and really fit. So two questions on that. Do you want to repeat the question and take a first go and then I'll say a few things out? Okay. So the question was, um, if you have peripheral neuropathy, how would you coach and teach movement and balance in that situation? What, you know, it's obviously a dilemma there. I'll say a quick side, but I really want Adam to, to comment to this too. Clinically speaking, as the three systems he went over, um, we try to ad adapt to the constraints or the challenges they have. So in that case, we might lean a bit more on visual and other somatosensory senses. Um, up the chain, uh, so have, have knee information, they're gonna need to access faculties that they have, maximize those faculties to compensate for, for the loss, uh, loss that they have. The shoe conversation, I think there's a lot to be said there, there's so many types of shoes. If you've read the news, our president has gotten a, a pair of focus, uh, white balance, and, um, uh, but we all, it's an important question. Uh, the equipment, I think there's pros and cons. It's really hard to get a perfect shoe. And I'll just jump in real quick. One of the concepts in motor control um, is if you have sensory information that's like there, but you're not interpreting it well, you want to practice. If you have sensory information that just isn't there, then you want to teach compensation. So that's, yeah, I mean, I, using other systems, using other strategies and things like that. Your, think, your question about what happens, you know, we talked about our three main systems. Well, if you have one that goes down to some extent, can you compensate with the other two? We think maybe, but what if you have two or more? That's exactly the topic of the last research grant that we submitted to NIH. And we are literally doing individual testing of people's inner ear by, actually we have an extra slide here. This wasn't planned, by the way. Um, so in this lab at uh, Massachusetts, we, I say we because it's my collaborator, so he's leading it really, I'm doing my own sort of part of it. but. He's taking people, moving them in this big contraption, and asking them, push a button when you think you've been moved. And he'll move them at different speeds and different velocities to try to get what is their vestibular threshold. When can they tell that they've been moved, right? And that's supposed to be a surrogate to give them some indication of what the sensory motor noise or variability or uncertainty is in their nervous system. They do the same thing for a visual dome. They say, push a button when you think the world moved then they also do it for peripheral neuropathy. And so they have them having things under their feet that move. They say, tell me when you think this has moved. And so our hypothesis is that when we take people, if they have more than one sensory system that has declined, we think that's gonna be the biggest predictor of falls. And so, yeah. Research show on 
Yeah, so the question is, what is the value of the, if I can use the term, uh, sequential, developmental, the milestones of a child learning to move, um, and the value of crawling in particular? So they're in a normal gestational period and after birth and a normal development, um, there is a sequence and there's evidence to show the benefit to having stages in movement development going in a certain order, a successive order. Um, so I do believe uh, parents would benefit from having education about how to facilitate and encourage transitions between the stages because uh, but it's also important, equally important to tell the parents, don't stress out if a child is late. You're going to have children in a phase where they're early and late, and it's not per month, and it doesn't mean something's wrong if they're a little late. Uh, so I would err on the side of um, let the child do what they're going to do, but give them different environments, give them cues. There's nothing wrong to give them uh, information that would help them transition their, their motor development. So. I'm sorry, can I jump on that one just a little bit? The really cool finding that we've done with infants is that um, we'll, uh, we've done a number of studies with infants and cerebral palsy and things like that, but in particular infants, we tried to learn how do they go from flopping over to sitting up independently to ultimately standing and walking. And one of the principles is that infants learn posture control from the top down. And parents naturally know this. If you took an infant and you put that infant on the table and just kind of like walked away, that would be really a bad choice if they were only a couple months old. If you even supported them at the waist, they'd flop over, right? But if you support them right under the armpits, they learn to control their head first, then support them a little bit lower, they'd flop. Give them a month, you can support them here. But if you support them lower, they flop. Give them another two or three months, you can support them at the waist, and they're fine sitting. But if you let go of the waist, they flop. It goes all the way down to the ankle. You control head posture, and then upper trunk, middle trunk, then your whole trunk, then you control the segments above the knee. So if any of you have little kids that haven't quite learned how to walk, and you wanna know what is their level of trunk control, or their level of control, start at the armpits, and work your way down, and at some point, they'll flop. And it does pose an interesting question of, uh, you know, that's how you acquire how is balance, is it compromised and maybe some similarities with that same pattern? I don't know, that would be a future research question, but I just thought the infant one is pretty cool to, so that you can actually try on with people, so. Um, this, yeah, go. So the question had to do with a institute here. Yeah, Neurofeld. Neurofeld. I personally don't, and I haven't. I don't know if Maury has any general comments to Steve. Seems like we're getting lower and lower. Um, I have heard of them, but I do not know a lot about them, to be honest. Um, uh, I've had a few patients that have gone there. I don't know the details and what they're approaches, so I couldn't say much. So the question is, uh, should you keep working on strength uh, versus flexibility, one more than the other at the same level? Um, I know I said in the slide mobility first and then strength, and that's generally true for a lot of rehab conditions and so forth. Um, if, you're, if you have good functioning mobility, I would very much emphasize the strength. And we're seeing muscle tissue as an organ that has many benefits beyond just a moving apparatus for the joints. Um, 
Yeah, uh, so so I if I had to choose between the two, I would take strength over flexibility training, and that would be like stretching, static or dynamic stretching. I would I would pick the strength if I had to pick. Obviously, both are bad, um, helpful, but I think you'll get more bang for your buck out of the strength training. So the question had to do with pain. When should you lay off? When should you push forward? Definitely yours. <laughs> uh, tricky one, but probably the best question to be asking on a day-to-day -day basis because the pain will change. Um, if you or your health providers know with clear, fairly clear certainty as to what the pain generator is and why it, what kind of pain it is. There's different types of pain, centralized pain, nociceptive pain on the periphery at the joint level and everything and in between. Um, once we know that, we can answer the question better as to when to push and when to not. Um, discomfort, I often say, uh, if we're trying to get mobility, don't be afraid of discomfort. Sometimes we want to hunt for hurt if we're trying to achieve something. And uh, it's not always, um, that, that's also a way to diminish pain, is to uh, oversensitize the, the discomfort or pain level to the point where the, the brain, the central nervous system, uh, has seen enough repetitions of the pain that it starts to decrease the perception of threat. So uh, again, you need to know what kind of pain you're dealing with and when it's safe to push but more times than not, we're treating pain by pushing into pain in the right doses um, in order to reduce your brain's perception of it. So plenty of low back studies in particular where we're actually needing to move the so-called injured area in order to reduce their perception or catastrophization of the pain experience. Yeah. In moderation, depends on what you, yeah, you, we have to talk often about what that moderation looks like. It's different for different people, but yeah. So the question had to do with um, using like Nordic type sticks in hiking and whether that's sort of over accommodating perhaps versus being helpful. And I'd be curious what you have to say. I mean, my hunch is there's, again, kind of probably a balance there in the sense that using an additional sensory cue that actually gives you uh, uh, cutaneous sensory feedback which is helpful for balance and it could sort of increase your base of support as well so that can be a helpful thing but it I suppose if you can manage without or maybe in doses manage without it to increase your balance system without the crutch um, but knowing that the crutch is there and there's real reasons why it would be helpful and probably wise to use if you're fatigued or if there's some risky spot you might be in. That's just, yeah. yeah, I mean, I would agree with that and also what Adam said earlier about that balance between um, there is good compensation. So in a case for safety reasons, it's fine to compensate with the canes or crutches, but try to again, push the envelope too, maybe in a different environment where it's a little safer to go without it and train some of the components of, of your gait or balance without the crutch. So probably mixing it together, conditionally based, yeah.
so I'll do. So my particular lab, it's, um, it's a little bit dangerous actually at the moment. <laughs> it's really for kind of custom research projects that I do. So if I'm ever doing a research project that involves people in the community, then certainly people would be invited to. But just sort of coming in and like hanging out with some of the metal and the aluminum around, it's probably not the best spot. But it's kind of geared more for experimental weird research stuff. Maury's is quite different though. Uh, yeah, my interest, it's a great question, because we all need access to information and, and so forth. Um, Variant Training Lab is a like a gym membership where you can go and there is this technology there and staff to support what you do. Um, it's pricier than a gym because it's not a gym, it's a lab and there's coaching and therapy involved. But, uh, but I, I think that's the hope for the future is how do we make more accessible um, uh, provisions, yeah. So the question is, uh, if you're osteopenic or osteoporotic, uh, and, and we know we need to get load bearing or resistance training uh, on board, um, is there value to carrying weight, right? Uh, whether it's with your hands or otherwise. I'll follow Adam, yes and no, in the literature. You have to be careful if it's out in the hands or at the ankles, like ankle weights or dumbbells or something you're holding and walking with, the lever of the arm and leg has some stronger torque applications at the proximal joints closer to the body. So you have to be careful about soft tissue injuries and things from that repetitive movement. Um, cl weights closer to the body would be more advantageous. Some of you may have heard of rucking these vests that are, have lead and weights in the vest that you put on. I often recommend that for osteoporotic, osteopenic patients, as long as the strapping is comfortable for them. But, uh, but yeah, you do need greater than body weight load to mineralize bone. Yeah, I think you'd solve the, the extremity risks a little bit, but I would argue um, it's not a great, it's not a normal gait pattern if you don't have some arm swing, and it might be facilitating other issues. Um, so it becomes, is the juice worth the squeeze, um, risk reward question um, on that. But I'd rather typically someone have normal gait and apply the weights in different ways than probably walk more rigid. Having said that, there's a great exercise called a farmer's carry where you do carry heavy weights at your side and walk short distances. But to go out on a walk like that for longer distances, I wouldn't necessarily recommend. But for really heavy weight, short distances, it would be great.